everyone. Welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. I am joined at the Aurora Borealis on this episode for a second time by comics creator, uh, author, creator Rick Hoberg. Rick, thank you for jumping in and joining. Oh, that's quite all right. And this is less the Aurora Borealis and more like the Rainbow Bridge and just coming oh, in like from it. Asgard. I like it. I like it. The The Asgard reference is appreciated. <laughs> Uh, folks out there will know you for a wide range of work from Marvel to DC, a character named Firestar, I believe, owes her uh, origin to you as well. Partially, yes, partially, <laughs> and visually, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, glad to have you back for a second episode, and on this episode, I'm curious to dig into a little bit of your work across media, if that is okay, in addition to comments. That's great. And, and you might have to uh, clarify some of the questions you had, just so I may I may interrupt and say, well, how do you mean that? You know, just Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Glad to do that. Uh, so I believe our first question exploring media and storytelling is uh, one of your fondest memories. Now, this could be anything from animation to film to comics, anything in your creative history that stands out as kind of a high watermark. Well, it probably has to be uh, 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 something like uh, Star Wars when I got that. And I, I was one of the few people who actually knew and, and had a good handle on what George Lucas was doing, along with Roy Thomas. He was well aware of it. Mm -hmm. But everybody else in the business, including some of the people I met who were working on the film, thought this was just going to be a B science fiction film, you know, and everything I was reading about it in the LA times via Charles Champlin's uh, 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 work was telling me that this was going to be a high budget fantasy adventure film, mm -hmm. much in the vein of Flash Gordon, which is what he was trying to get hold of. And he couldn't get it, which is, better for everybody because Star Wars has turned out to be a lot of fun all the way along the way. But for me, it was just, uh, I thought, oh, there's a good chance for me to get some high profile uh, work. And once I was handed the work, I'm going, oh, this is even much more than I thought it was. Especially after I saw the film, I was really stunned by it. Uh, and of course, it's become a, a cultural phenomenon and a mainstay. Uh, it's definitely a high water mark. And then I also read, now this is the internet, which is sometimes accurate, mostly accurate, hopefully accurate. Uh, did you do work on the film It as well, the original miniseries? Is that right? Yes, that was the storyboard artist on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm curious well, about what that was like. Yeah. That was a great uh, uh, opportunity because everything else I'd done in live action up to that point was really lackluster and not a lot of fun, kind of grueling uh, mm -hmm. work. The only fun I had is when I get to go to uh, meet people or accidentally run into people that I, I, I would like to meet. Like uh, I ran into Elizabeth Taylor there one day at Canon oh. Films. And that was just a moment where I went, wow, she's more gorgeous than everybody said she was kind of a reaction. <laughs> but also she was small. And and I'm I'm of short stature myself, but she was smaller than I am, and and uh, it was the same way when I met Annette O'Toole on the set of It. She was uh, uh, she's very short, and that was nice because you know it's nice to talk to somebody. <laughs> I I have been looking up at everybody all the time, but the uh, the whole cast was just delightful, except for Tim Curry because he particularly kept himself aloof from the rest of us to keep that essence of uh, uh, Pennywise uh, um, it, it, and the fear everybody wanted to have of him there all the time. But for instance, uh, uh, John Ritter was a, a totally charming guy, just a delight to be around, very funny all the time. Him and Tim Reed in particular kind of teamed up as, uh, as friends and were just delightful to be around. The whole cast, they were really great. Yeah, uh, well, and that, of course, uh, is a cultural classic as well. And I just recently watched the the remake of it. So it's the perfect time here around Halloween to talk about that. And uh, yeah. good on Tim Curry, although uh, I'm sure it would have been nice to meet him and talk with him oh, to, yeah, he to was keep a, that mystique. 
Yeah, I was a fan of his. And I, I should mention that It is my favorite Stephen King novel. I just absolutely want the minute they said, would you like to work on this? I went, I went yes, get me that job. And it was fun to, to work in Canada because I'd only worked in Hollywood on films. But the Canadian uh, uh, filmmaking industry was so much nicer and, and easier to work within because everybody was treated equally, where there's a really, there, at least there was a really ridiculous hierarchy in, uh, uh, in Hollywood uh, filmmaking. Yeah. And you sometimes couldn't get along with certain people. Like for me, the directors just kept themselves aloof, basically. Sorry, I'm knocking away a, a puppy who's trying to get my attention now. No worries. And, no. Um, I, I really enjoyed working with uh, uh, the, the director on it. He was he was a lot of fun. He was great. Yeah. yeah. Good to have good camaraderie. And uh, of course, I'm interested in what it's like to go from comics to animation to film. What what was it like to sort of pivot across those different worlds? Well, it certainly taught me a lot about uh, storytelling. And that's what I like most about it, because each of them is 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 very similar. But yet the, what you have to really focus on when you're doing my job is storytelling and the elements of storytelling. And they can be different as well as the, the approach to them is different in any uh, medium that I work on. In fact, comics is, is always was my first love, but I began to realize just how great it was to work not only in the element of design and, and momentary impact, that is just one frame of something in a comic, you have to tell a lot of stories with, but in film, you have to deal with time elements and, and uh, you have to be able to realize that you're going to have to get three or four cuts in something very quickly to be able to tell the, the story and get it across to the, to the audience. So there were, there were, it, was, it was good for me to learn this because then I became pretty uh, adept at it by the time I was in my, I don't know, my second or third de decade of, of uh, storytelling. And particularly the second decade, I think, with the 90s is where I think I really hit a, hit a stride with everything. Because I was pretty good and, and full of uh, uh, piss and vinegar, you might say, when I started out. So I was getting, I was doing a lot of things that I might not have done before. So I was experimenting a lot when I got on to, when I did Star Wars and then did about the same thing, What If, with Roy Thomas, which was great fun it's turned out, and I thought it was kind of a quirky uh, book to do because I knew it would be throwaway stories the way I was looking at it. And then now, just recently, a lot of it has become canon in the Marvel universe. And I'm looking back, going, "Wow, I was really lucky to be one of the two guys who created Thordis, you know, the female Thor character." Mm -hmm. Because when I heard about it um, about 19, I mean, 2010 or 12, whenever the first comic came out, the Mighty Thor. Um, I, I knew it was a female Thor, but when one of my friends who I was working with at Halo came out to me and said, hey, Rick, did you know that Jane Foster is that character? And I went, wow, that is the character we created. Mm -hmm. So when Roy was asked by Don Glute and I, so who did create this character when we were all talking about it? We said, we did, Roy, because he had uh, uh, given us the mandate of coming up with some ideas for What If, and we took... Uh, uh, this one and ran with it and went to him with it. And he said, yeah, yeah, and fleshed that out. And it became a great story for me because I was able to do my first, what I considered really good comic book. And that was because I had all this great reference of Jack Kirby's Thor's to deal with, as well as my love of mythology and all the characters involved in the Avengers. So it, it, it came to a confluence of making me a, a real professional at that point. And I really had faith in my work. But right. it took a long time for me to get to the point where I was totally feeling like I could do almost anything I needed to do in comics. And that happened about the time I took Green Arrow on, which was more than a decade later. Right. I did a couple other really high profile things, especially the All-Star Squad. But I, I had the, 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 um, the, the box kicked out from under me a couple times along the way, on Batman in particular. 
And um, and I was lucky to have guys like um, Dick Giordano was always behind me. He always helped me out, even when it wasn't working with my co-creators on things. Mm -hmm. And once I hit uh, Green Arrow, I had the the, um, the 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 shield and buckler of, of Mike Grell and Mike Gold to keep me in place on that book. I didn't have to take any other uh, criticism other than those two guys. And I was actually the saving grace in many times on that book because I was getting my work done come hell or high water on it. And I, very, I never, I don't think I ever used an assistant on that book. Mm -hmm. Not like I had to the strangers when the strangers came along. There was a couple of issues where I had to uh, get guys like uh, Frank, uh, Frank uh, uh, Fosco, excuse me. I should know that, that mm -hmm. name, but memory is getting a little lax at this point. Uh, Frank Fosco really jumped in and helped me out a lot. And I had a couple of issues where uh, another guy, I'm, I'm going blank again, but he's ended up working on The Matrix and other things. He's a very talented guy who who worked at Marvel for a while. And if I come up with a name, I'll I'll, I'll try and tell you because it's just not fair to him that I, I'm not uh, using his name. But he jumped in and helped me out with a couple of issues also. Yeah. So, uh, but Green Arrow was really a good place for me. I learned to do something I'd never done before, which was realistic comics. And I had, I, I learned I could use a lot of different media and get away with things because I'd already learned how to draw. So I was using a lot of photo reference and stuff like that to create that book, which is what Mike Grell wanted, actually. That's nice. I have uh, met Mike Grell in person at conventions and things like that. And he seems to be kind of a straight shooter. He knows what he's looking for and uh, yeah. something yeah. you would want in a collaborator, somebody that doesn't make it mysterious in any way. Yeah. And I think he was willing to take a shot at me being able to do this because I was a guy, I was a guy who wasn't going to let them down. It's just not in my, my, my nature any, at that point. To, to screw in with a deadline or anything like that. So I was willing to test myself and it took a while. I mean, it took, uh, I'm going to guess six to eight issues before I felt really comfortable. And then I really fell into a groove and with John Nyberg inking me, it was just a really nice uh, a run. On that. And like I said, everything was a realistic story. So it was, it was fun to do that kind of thing, which I hadn't done before, but I began to miss the, the fantasy aspect of the, the traditional superheroes. And that's why I went over and, and jumped on the strangers when I had the opportunity. That's nice. Yeah. But it sounds like comics um, inform some of your work in animation, film storyboarding and, and things of that nature too. Yes, it did. And, 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 but I did, as I said before, I learned the difference between the two and what you needed to make good film and good comic books is different are different things completely mm. because uh in, in pre prior to that when they started being influenced by comic books and, and not the other way around because many comics from the 40s were influenced by films mm. Mm -hmm. and especially guys like jack kirby and will eisner and people like that really <laughs> used filmic type techniques in their storytelling the, the spirit is full of it it's just completely packed full of the influences of film but then that kind of turned around when batman happened in the 60s and they began to use uh, techniques in batman which would have been they, they were considered campy but having re-watched batman in recent times i'm realizing oh they were they were really trying to do something that was similar to the comics that were being produced at that point mm -hmm. and it looked campy but they really uh, worked for the medium such as those uh uh tilted angles that they were using every time there was a villain or a villain's hideout and in, in his cohorts they they would use the tilted angles and and i thought that's really fascinating because that is something you would do in a comic although they weren't doing it a lot at that point they wanted to keep things pretty straight but mm -hmm. in television it worked really well for it and they've since gone to that and then pulled back from it so that they're not doing it all the time because it does get to be a little cliche Anything becomes cliche if you use it too much. Yeah, yeah. They were paying attention to some of those panel designs. It sounds oh, like yeah, that. yeah. And the characters, too. I mean, the, yeah. the characters like that I'm really admiring them because I'm rewatching it again now. And 
Good Lord, Julie Newmar's Catwoman is like, she revolutionized the character in the TV show. I mean, it went from being a fun character in the comics to being this wonderful paramour for, for, for Batman. Yeah. And just the just the fact that she was constantly wanting to be a crook, but really deeply in love with Batman really is evident in those stories. And it's a lot of fun. And Cesar Romero's Joker is, is terrific, as is Frank Gorshin's uh, Riddler and, and Burgess Meredith's Penguin. And there's a couple others there are really good. The one that I really have gotten to love was Eli Wallach's version of Mr. Freeze. He is so much better than the other characters. George Sanders was delightful because you, who'd have ever thought they'd get a guy like that to play that role? But Eli Wallach is just delightful as Mr. Freeze. He's just great in the role. Yeah. Well, and then to see him later in life in the holiday and to, to see those kind of throwbacks to classic cinema. And sometimes I'll see Vincent Price. I saw him recently. I was re-watching Edward Scissorhands and uh just reminding myself oh yeah he was he was uh egghead and then yeah, uh, yeah. of course roddy mcdowell is bookworm and, and things like that uh, some really solid talent oh completely yeah yeah and they influenced what they did with batman the animated series mm -hmm. and they they really did a good job in bringing those characters down to earth in that series and i loved what they did with it especially recently i read a lot of posts about people hating this new version of the Penguin that they're using in the Batman. Now, mm -hmm. I got to tell you, I love the Batman. I thought that was a terrific version of Batman. Yeah. And yeah. they're saying that, you know, they've never done this before. You know, you, you know, turned him into a gangster and I said, in, in the comics and stuff. And I'm like, wait a minute. That uh -huh. came about in the animated series when they turned him into a casino owner or, a, or I should say a nightclub owner. And I'm going... To me, it was the best way to keep the character grounded. And I think that Colin Farrell's version is just terrific. It's a good show, too. It's really yeah. a, 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 a meat and potatoes kind of godfatherish kind of type of gangster series. And I like it. I think it's really fun to watch. When you, you mentioned it's never been done before. I mean, what a compliment to something that is decades old. And as you mentioned, it, it has been done in certain ways, but to bring it to life that way, uh, I, I'm in complete agreement. And Colin Farrell is delightfully unrecognizable in that role, oh, too. He's an amazing actor in that. He's completely yeah. uh, uh, hidden by his character. And that's something that any actor can be proud of. As long as you don't get typecast that way and you can't get out of it. But now nah, he'll always be a great. He was, he, and didn't he, he was up for an Academy Award or something for that wonderful uh, uh, story about those two friends on that, on that uh, Irish island in. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. uh, with Patrick, uh, Patrick Gleason, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. Jane, uh, yeah, you're right. With Patrick, I think it was Gleason. Brendan Gleason. Brendan, Brendan Gleason. Yeah. Yeah. Just a terrific movie. Both of them were just terrific in that. Just good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the anyway. latest episode, Christine Milotti, there, there's really great background on her character. I won't give anything away if you haven't oh, seen it. I, I haven't seen the fourth episode yet. Yeah, no. Yeah. That, I, I, just, I just finished the third last week, and I, I have evenings these days where I can't get watching anything for a couple of reasons one is this new puppy of ours he, she is just focused on me so every <laughs> evening it's about play with me here's a ball throw it for me and she barks at me if I don't do something with it so that takes the time and then I also am in the middle of doing a, a horror thing for every evening right, the, the, uh, of, of October mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm having fun with a combination of photographs and drawing and and things like that that I'm playing with on on a, on Clip Studio Paint, which I, I is my new go to thing. That Photoshop used to be. I put that aside now. And Clip Studio Paint is what I use for all of my um, creation of of comics and stuff. Even if it's traditional drawing stuff, there's so many things you can do with it. There's ready made zip a tone the tones and things like that that are just a delight to to play with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what what a great time to be a creator in October. It's one of my favorite times of year and uh, <clears throat> to get to play with some of the darker corners of creating as well. It's a, it's a pretty yeah. inspiring and fruitful time. Yeah. And most of the, what I'm doing is in the story area of Facebook. So it mm -hmm. only lasts 24 hours and it's gone. And it's also 
I believe it's also on Instagram, but I don't really, I know they overlap, but I don't always look in on both of them. But that story thing is really fun to play with and having it there for just a short time. And I'm always amazed at some of the reaction I get to it. The ephemeral art. The, the exactly. Blink yeah. and you miss yeah. it, yeah. yeah. And I'm at a point in my, my career right now where I'm not working regularly. I'm just doing things for myself. Mm-hmm. And I like doing uh, uh, commissions and stuff, but now I'm working on a graphic novel as well as um, uh, I did a short uh, a horror story, a, a monster story for uh, for some guys that have put together uh, um, a, a company called Monster Forge, and they're doing some monster comics similar to what marvel did you know where the monsters are heroes basically okay. uh, okay. what they offered me was a, a gill man like the creature from the black lagoon only it's a weird gill man it's a guy who actually becomes this creature and then turns back again and i thought oh i love that and so okay. i jumped on that i've had i had a good time playing with that that's for sure because i just love those kind of characters yeah well i will be interested to see how that shapes up that's one of my favorite characters from the universal monsters worlds as well the yeah, uh it, it's man. exactly that kind of thing exactly well he's got tentacles and stuff so he's he's not exactly the creature from the black book well i was going to ask as someone who has been in the world of creating for some time uh, there's of course talk of AI. There, there are all these things that are out in the news and in the world. But I'm curious how you envision uh, the next stages of storytelling and where comics and film and media go from here. Well, uh, I'm kind of glad that I'm out of it for right now because I believe it's going to be a little bleak. Um, mm-hmm. I think many people are going to uh, be using this sort of stuff and step away from their creativity. And honestly, I'm still of a mind that, because uh, I admit that when when this stuff started up, I jumped, I didn't jump into it, but I went over and looked at one of them that is prominent. And I played with a couple of things to see what it could come up with, not intending to use it, but just wanted to test it. Mm-hmm. And lackluster at best even though it gave me a, a, a lovely representation it wasn't exact and it was uh, obviously pulling from various sources so and I know now that a lot of my uh, colleagues that are still working in the business are they're losing their jobs and they're they're only getting uh, short amounts of time at uh, in in productions and they're being asked to use this stuff and I, they don't have the luxury that I do. I'm saying absolutely not. You'll never get me to do some of that for pay. I mm-hmm. won't, and I'm not going to have anything to do with it because it's a waste of my time. I've only got ten years, maybe or so, left that I'm going to be any good at what I do because I have a Parkinson's diagnosis, and it's not bad now. But the doctor tells me it could get. And I'm 72, and it tells me that if by the time I'm 85 or 90, it could really set in. Well, I'm going, I'll probably be dead by then anyway. So, you know, I'm I'm happy to uh, just have the time I've got to not worry about it because it isn't affecting my creativity or my drawing or my thinking or anything like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or physically, there's only a minor a tremor here and there that isn't affecting my drawing at all. I, I, I can really focus on that and stay uh, aloof from the tremor that way. It only affects me when I like pick up a full cup of coffee or something like that, and then I have to steady it with the other hand. So it, I want to take the time I have to really just keep my mind active and doing new things and playing with new projects and new things I'm finding, like the Clip Studio Paint and... And I've got a couple of painting programs that I found and I'm going to start doing some painting from it, you know, because right. I'm not crazy about painting in the studio because I have to admit, I, I don't like all the mess it creates. And I I did painting for for a few years in college and, and past that, but I could only ever get interested in um, acrylics and gouache because it was easy to do with and easy to clean up. But Oil paint just drives me nuts. I don't like the smell. I don't like the mess. But I can get the effect in certain uh, programs that I'm playing with now. So I've got too many other things I want to do, and I don't want to have anything to do with AI. 
And AI, I think, is also going to turn out to be a real disaster for certain companies that are just going to hand it over to a director and tell them, make me an entire film with this. Because I know it's happened. I know that people have done it. Okay. But I think you're going to have to be pretty damned creative and observant to get that right all the way along and to come up with something that's going to be revolutionary and on the level of, let's say, Kerry Conran's uh, uh, camp, camp, uh, Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow, which was just a delightful film. I rewatched that all the time. So I just don't know if it's going to be uh, possible for them to do that. And I doubt that it is because they're not going to get a lot of guys like me who are interested in working with them on this. I don't yeah. know. But I, I spend my day job as an English teacher working with students in writing and finding their voices. And you can totally tell the difference between something that is an AI generated sort of BS machine and an actual human voice. Uh, yeah. And it's so much better, even if you have to do some edits to see the human voice than it is to see sort of the, I don't know, the the mixture of whatever else is out there that just sort of falls into the bland category of it's been done before, so here it is. Yeah. Yeah. Where I'm a person who just doesn't believe that it, you have to do everything by yourself. It's great to collaborate. I've always enjoyed it. And I think my best things have always been when I'm collaborating with other people. I never so far something like my own project, but my own project is really, really uh, uh, shaped by things I loved as a kid and the things I grew up as a teenager reading in comics. And I, I can openly tell you, it's, it's got a lot of uh, Magnus Robot Fighter and the Metal Men in it because it's mm. about robots. And these are characters that I really loved and I still have a fascination with. I, I have no idea why nobody's attempted to do either one of them as a film. It, it just doesn't True. make sense to me. But I mean, just these last few weeks with what been going on with AI, I'm going, oh God, we are going to need Magnus Robot Fighter in some place <laughs> along the line, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah, and that would be a great property for uh, a film company to take up and, and to try to do the right way, for sure. Yeah, oh yeah, well, most of the best stuff is when they try to adapt it pretty uh, uh, pretty close to the, to the source material. Mm -hmm. That's why Marvel's been uh, been uh, successful. Certainly, they change things, but you look at stories like the, their Iron Man origin or their Captain America story, and you go, "Wow, that pretty much is just what the comics would have wanted." You know? And I, I just love what they did with that stuff, as opposed to some of the films that have been done where they're just going completely off the rails on on uh, what they want to do with it, as opposed to what the source material stated. True enough. True enough. Yeah. Yeah. There's been movies like Suicide Squad. I, I didn't like either one. I, I thought, wow, this is just not at all what Suicide Squad really would be like. I don't think. You know, I just mm -hmm. I didn't like. It. I just even with James Gunn at the helm, I, I thought the the wacky stuff was fun, like Star of the Conqueror and things like that. But it was just a vehicle for, for making a star out of Harley Quinn and so forth. And that's not at all what Suicide Squad was about. Yeah. Yeah. True. The, the Ostrander material is really interesting going back uh, years and years to when they first debuted and those eighties comics. Uh, it's hard to top those as far as the Suicide oh, yeah. Squad. Yeah. And the stuff that Ostrander and McDonald were doing together. I, I love Luke McDonald's work on that stuff. Mm -hmm. That was just great. I like John Ostrander's work too, but McDonald was hitting a real stride at that point in his arbor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, in terms of the stories that you're telling, um, your work on the Gilman, your graphic novel approaches and uh, the stories that you want to tell anywhere where listeners can go to follow along, to see those things as they come to be and uh, keep up with your career as it is unfolding? Um, they will soon. Yeah, they will soon. It, it's If you want to you know, find me, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram and I have a website. It's called Rick Holberg Story Artist. And you can see a lot of the things I'm doing. I haven't presented any of the, uh, the graphic novel yet, but I, I'm tempted to because I think I'd like to present it to begin with as a comic book in a series of, 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 of episodes until it's completed. Because mm -hmm. I've got more than half of it done now, completely done. That is everything from writing to artwork. And it's just a matter of um, 
what, what my biggest fear is, is that I'm going to have to go back and change something once I really finalize the finale, because that's still up in the air for me. I know where I'm going with it, but I'm not sure how it's going to occur. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those things that I, I think, well, that'll be okay. If I have to go back and change something, that'll be just part of the creative process. And I don't know anybody, anything on this. It'll be a good piece of work. That's for sure. I, I, I really look really proud of much of it. It's a lot, it's a lot of fun to read and it's uh, just exactly what I wanted to do. So um, and it very much feels like those comic books I mentioned. It's not, uh, there's no period violence of note. I mean, even though there is danger involved, there's not, uh, there's not a lot of, you know, um, real, like I said, period violence or, or anything mm-hmm. like that. Just because I don't see the need for it. There might be by the end, but I'm not crazy about the idea of it. It just doesn't work for this story. I want it to be more like the things I read as a childhood. Like I, I always loved Magnus and the way uh, uh, Russ Manning approached the violent aspect of, of what Magnus had to do. And even when he got hurt, it, you really felt it because he was yeah. like, you know, once in a while he'd get clobbered by one of those robots and you're going, wow, he's just a guy taking that from a metal creature. That's That's tough. So it'll it'll be more like that sort of stuff, I would think. Yeah, love that. Uh, following the narrative need, and so it's just dropping it in because it's always a good creative choice. Yeah, I, I just think it's my nature anyway. I just never have been crazy about doing that sort of material. I was I'm fine with doing it in Green Arrow. When we were doing that because that was about a bounty hunter, and I knew what we were doing. But even uh, Mike would give me the leeway not to have him kill somebody if I felt it was necessary, uh, but to wing them and make sure that you knew the guy was down because of it. Okay. Uh, so, and I don't think we actually killed too many people, one one or two along the way, because that's what he wanted in many cases. He wanted this to have a real gritty feel to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, like I said, I always admired his work. So I, I went along with almost everything that we did. Well, I appreciate your time. Uh, I'm glad to have you back anytime. This was our second chat and certainly glad to have you back for a third as you're working on sure. projects. And uh, yeah, I'm talking to you. Yeah. Yeah. Great to talk with you as well. Uh, and I will talk with you again soon.